Why is the industry motivated to transition to a green chemistry and a circular bioeconomy? Which drivers are forcing them to do so? And how can this major change be supported? So the motivations. We start by the most obvious one, climate change. The EU has pledged to become climate neutral by 2050. And several large industrial companies have already pledged similar pledges uh, even earlier than that. And other countries have also followed suit. Climate change can already be felt by all of us. And the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all living through at the moment has shown to us that some realities of nature will not bend to economic frameworks and that ignoring them does not make this reality go away. I think this realization is also sinking in, even more slowly, when it comes to climate change. The best time to do something about it would of course have been 25 years ago, but it's definitely time to act now. And we see this in actions. Investors and insurers, as well as activists, are reading sustainability reports very carefully and studying the environmental risks of companies. We also see a greater interest by the general public in sustainable solutions. So it's clear that business as usual cannot go on. We must leave fossil fuels in the ground. And since chemistry cannot be decarbonized, this means finding another source for our materials. So if we consider that a sustainable economy, in this we need to stop relying on fossil-based carbon, we need to find a way to keep carbon in the loop for longer. We will also need to rely on new carbon sources to replace the carbon lost in the different recycling processes that we can develop. And this would, amongst others, be biogenic carbon from biomass. It could also be atmospheric carbon or carbon from industrial side streams. But using carbon from biomass to build the materials we all use and supplying the chemical industry with another source of their so needed intermediates. Sustainability, however, is not only about the carbon footprint. A sustainable bio-based circular economy will also need to fulfill the promises of less toxic chemicals, smaller environmental footprints and protected biodiversity. And that's then the second motivation, a chance to replace toxic chemicals with novel, less hazardous ones and to replace the current high resource intensive chemical processes with biocatalysis and fermentation. But is that all there is? What about getting better products? And not only less harmful ones with a smaller ecological footprint, but actually superior in the functionality. And this is where biotechnology can make a difference. It can access molecules which cannot be synthesized in chemical processes or make the production of those molecules much simpler. Advances in metabolic engineering and synthetic biology have made this possible, cutting down immensely on the time to create production strains. So these are the motivations behind it. Smaller footprints, better products. What are the drivers? Again, climate change is the main driver. While markets and opinions may change and the oil price might remain low, um, chemical synthesis might remain the easier and the time-tested route. <clears throat> However, our reaction to climate change has finally begun. Building back better and greener after the pandemic is a mantra which keeps being repeated and it coincides with the EU Green Deal and a host of other policies put forward by the European Union. It also becomes increasingly clear that the environmental external costs racked up by fossil-based processes are a threat. And they're not only a threat to us, humans and the environment, but also to financial assets. Investors are increasingly realizing that these externalities pose a risk to their investment. And this is especially the case for large investors such as pension funds, who have really long-term view, or institutional investors, which rely on the overall market development for their growth. And even BlackRock has now warned CEOs of major companies of climate risks in their portfolio. So companies need to show their sustainability efforts, they need to monitor their supply chain and manage environmental risks. For this, they also invest heavily in digitization to track feedstocks, for example, making sure that no deforestation can be linked to their supply chain. There is also a growing societal pull, a growing interest in where all of our stuff is coming from, and an understanding that there might be hidden costs involved. We're usually very good at knowing about these hidden costs, but trying to not think of them overly much, but consumers are increasingly demanding the products they buy be sustainable as a given, as a baseline. And brand owners want to avoid the stigma of being involved in unsustainable practices or pollution. And this creates a strong pull by the market, which is being transferred from brand owners down the supply chain. If the textile used in a t-shirt is sustainable and marketed as bio whatever, 
It will not be long before the question is asked whether the chemicals that went into its dying or finishing are also sustainable and whether they're not harmful to the environment. Or the question of what happens with my textile once I'm done with it. Can it be recycled? Well, what will be the end of life <coughs> perspective? And also, why is my sports shirt contributing to the microplastic pollution of the oceans? Um, it's the literal drop in the ocean to avoid microplastic in the bathroom in, in creams and shampoos. However, if we know that the main um, input of microplastic to the ocean is actually from car tires and our clothes that we wash. So these are consumer demands and questions which hit, which hit brand owners first and then they trickle down the value chain and they open up chances for innovation. So how can these chances be seized and made good on? And that's where we come into regulation, policy support and financing and networking. So if you want to see change at the pace we need it to make a difference towards mitigating climate change, and that is what we need, we will need regulation, both in incentives to move towards sustainable products in a circular bioeconomy, and in regulations banning harmful substances like we've seen with BPA. Of course, these regulations always come with a risk to go down the wrong path. They need to be target aimed not technology dictating, and work towards a level playing field. Because it is about competing with an established business. Green chemistry, new bio-based processes, and the circular bioeconomy compete with decades old and efficient chemical fossil based processes running in dep depreciated industrial plants. And one has the benefits of years of subsidies, externalized costs, which are and will for decades be borne by all of us, and the other is new and innovative and very capex heavy, full of risks, and is also being scrutinized for undesirable effects. Um, for example, in land use change, GMOs, food versus fuel, um, slightly slanted by material use, and a whole host of expectations to bring in a new economy, which I heard John Bell from the Commission say, is expected to bring peace between nature and economy. So that's a lot of expectations to fulfill against a strong competition in a not yet level playing field. So how can we manage these expectations? Because this is a dangerous a position to be in. Are we letting the perfect be the enemy of the good? If we insist on the perfect solution that has no harmful effects and has shown this through careful analyses, LCAs and whatever, we risk not getting the good or good enough one which takes us on a road towards climate neutrality and a sustainable economy. So in the end, I can also end again with climate change. It's a hurdle, but it's also a chance. At, as humans, we don't usually embrace change, neither in our personal lives, nor does big industry. We prefer to have a life undisrupted and keep all of our amenities. However, it's clear if we want to keep our planet habitable for us humans, we must change. And driving this change are game changes like green chemistry, biotechnology and the circular economy. This is being recognized in several EU policy papers, but also in policy actions in our home state here in North Rhine-Westphalia, for example, in the structural change program that Minister Pinkvad alluded to. Technology is not the problem. The technologies are there. The researchers also here in the NRV have shown this. But now we need to bring these technologies into the industrial scale and deploy them into the market. So we want to seize those immense chances for innovation and a new economy. The stakes are high and the field is big. And this means that no industry player can go it alone. Collaboration, joining forces and finding novel paths is imperative. At CLIB, we work towards that. We network our over 100 members from large industries, SMEs, academic institutes and investors and infrastructure providers from this region and beyond to find new value chains, new projects and business ideas. We support startups and SMEs to improve their innovations, to get the right partners and bring their ideas to the market. We do this, for example, in areas of lignin valorization, C1 gases at feedstock, high performance ingredients for markets such as food and feed, home and personal care, textiles or coatings and adhesives. We look at using side streams from the agro food industry for biotechnology processes across borders and with municipalities involved and we aim for scaling up those technologies into the market. We're based in Dusseldorf, here in North Rhine-Westphalia, the main hub of chemistry in Germany, as we just heard, and we're connected to our neighbors in nearby Netherlands and the Flanders region of Belgium in the Big Cluster Initiative.
With our partners in the 3BI intercluster, we partner in France, the UK and the Netherlands to increase our network. And this helps us to bring value to our members and the state, networking biotechnology to create sustainability. And it's my special pleasure to see so many of our members and partners taking part in this event, both yesterday and today. And I'm looking forward to the following presentations, which will give you exciting examples of those innovations I mentioned earlier. Thank you very much.